It is rare to find so much industry expertise all in one spot, right at your fingertips. The world of public adjusting and insurance claims can be a scary one. This changes now. That's why we built this podcast for you, where all the industry experts converge. Let us be your guide to education and personal growth. You're listening to Because Experience Matters, the show for public adjusters who want to up their game. Hosted by the 2021 Public Adjuster of the Year, Jack Hanks. How much money are you leaving on the table by not knowing all the approaches you can take to maximize the payouts to the insured and profits for your business? On this show, you will discover untapped strategies to become an unstoppable public adjuster and an effective advocate for your clients. In every episode, Jack brings on all the industry big dogs, including leading roofers, contractors, lawyers, accountants, and marketers. You'll access the insider scoop, real case studies, real obstacles, and actionable winning solutions. Let's jump in so that you can stop working hard and start working smart. All right, guys, Jack Hanks, Because Experience Matters podcast. Uh, Today, I'm I'm pretty excited about this. I was actually um, up a little bit last night thinking about this. We have the one and only Mr. Steve Badger as a guest today. Um, Steve, once again, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I don't think people, you don't have to do this. It means a lot you're coming on to talk. It's pretty cool, so. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, as people who know me are well aware, I believe dialogue is good. We may not necessarily agree on issues, but I want to hear what the other hot side has to say. And yeah. I'd like the, the other side to hear what I have to say. So thanks for having me. I look forward to discussing uh, some of the issues with you. Yeah, it's kind of neat, man. Like I said, the last, I've, I've noticed a little bit of a change in you. If I could, if I can talk about that, um, I started going to Windows Storm about, well, I was at the first one and I've noticed, and you even said it on stage this year with, with, with hoteling, you, you, you've, you've learned a lot from our side, which is cool, right? That most of the roofers and a lot of my PA friends were actually pretty decent people. We're trying to do the right thing. And as well as your side, and I think that's where we do have some common ground that you're actually saying there is not all, we're not all assholes on this side, right? So. No, and I'll tell you, and I, uh, I never believed everyone on the other side were assholes. <laughs> I just didn't emphasize that belief. I just focused on all the bad stuff that I saw and never stepped back and said, look, now I recognize, you know, 95% of you are good people trying to do the right thing, you know, but no one ever calls me up and says, Badger, I got this claim that's going really well. We want to hire you. You know, they only call me on the ones where they're all screwed up. So I got to make sure I'm not uh, Don Quixote and everything looks like a windmill. So, you know, and I think that's huge. We all get caught in that, right? Because we only get the files that are a mess and there's a problem and you know, yep. and it's, I think we all get a little tainted in our view and it's nice to take a step back and realize, um, you know, we're actually all people. We all have families. We're all at the core, the people I'm involved with and yourself included are, are just want to do a good job. And sometimes that job may be different on either side. So um, that's part of it, right? Can yep. you, can you, and I saw last week on LinkedIn. So we do a lot of work with Chip Merlin. He's, man, he's really talking about a good guy um, and means a lot and wants to do well for the business as well. You guys were in London last week having a couple of beers in the pub together, um, which I thought was pretty neat. Can you tell me what you and Chip are doing over there? Because I was very intrigued by that. We do a lot of Lloyd stuff, and that's a whole intriguing saga over there. Can you kind of talk about what you guys were doing and everything? Sure. Uh, my firm does a lot of work with the London market, you know, with Lloyd's of London and then other insurers that are in London. And every year, London has a uh, conference called the PICS Conference, P-I-C-G-S. It's the Property Insurance Claims Group. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, conference, their leadership, asked me and Chip to come into their conference and do a debate or a discussion about the issues. I will tell you it was controversial because uh, London is very old guard, very conservative, yeah. but uh, they had some progressive peeping, uh, thinking people on their committee. And they said, no, let's bring in a policyholder attorney, a, a reputable one with Chip, and have him uh, talk with Badger about the issues. So we appeared before the group and did a one hour uh, debate uh, of all the hot topics in uh, the first party insurance world. And I got to tell you, it was really well received. Uh, people were impressed by uh, what Chip had to say. Uh, and conversely, 
as you saw from his post, Chip was quite impressed with London. You know, we gave him a tour. We took him all through the Lloyd <laughs> building and he got to see the bell and he got to see the ceremonial meeting room and the library. And I think it gave Chip an appreciation that London is really a mature insurance market. They're professionals. They take pride in what they do. And Chip saw that. Uh, now, we often disagree, of course, you know, on coverage and scope and those issues. But uh, I think Chip saw uh, exactly what you were just talking about, yeah, that there are professionals on our side who want to do the right thing. We just don't always agree on what that is. You know, yeah, 100%. You know, I, I think the biggest problem, and I'm gonna, I, I don't want to overstep my boundaries, but I think on both sides is lack of training. Um, I, I pull my hair out, what's left of it. Um, we, we train four times a year PA. We train 250 of our competitors. And I, 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 I get astounded by the lack of professionalism and lack of training on our side that not a lot of guys are doing it right. And it's very frustrating. And at the same time, I don't think the carriers invest enough time in, in training their side as well, because you got to read the, you got to know the stuff like you got to read it and understand it. And sometimes that's where, that's where the miss the misfire is, I believe, on both sides. How do you feel about that, Steve? I agree. Look, training is important. We should put qualified people out in the field on both sides. Uh, and uh, I understand there's a lot of discussion about the insurance industry having a talent drain, right? The old smart EGAs are no longer around. And uh, so I get that. You know, there is a concern and uh, everyone should put qualified people out there. As a uh, antidote, uh, Chip told a story about his concern about the public adjuster side. Yeah. That uh, his girlfriend was curious what it would take to become a PA. So she just took the exam. She's an accountant and she took a PA exam just cold and passed or missed it by one point. I don't know. And <laughs> the point was that perhaps even you know, on, on his side, and he chips a, you know, a, a, a strong supporter of public adjusters, yeah. he said perhaps uh, additional education uh, is needed. And I agree. Look, adjusters out in the field should know what they're doing. But remember, you know, with adjusters, that most adjusters go out and one day they look at a fire, the next day they look at a roof, the next day they look at a foundation. So it's hard for them to know everything about every potential type of loss, which is why, you know, they bring in consultants and engineers. But yeah, I agree. Everyone who's out there should know what they're doing. Yeah, it's tough because sometimes we have conversations. You can tell that, you know, these young adjusters, you know, they're just green and, you know, we're not trying to, um, well, I'm trying to get my, my case solved, but at the same time, I don't want to demean them or, or make them feel less than because that's not going to do any good. So we try on our end to explain and document why there's a problem here and our, our feelings on why it should be covered and, you know, be professional about it, I think is the key. And yep. we lack that on our end sometimes and it gets frustrating. So, um, so a big, huge topic um last few years since getting more hot is this this lump sum thing and i know you're a proponent of it somewhat um i i get it at the same time you know when we do submit a lump sum the most carrier adjusters are like no i need a line item back and da 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 so we, you know i look at it this way my, my job is to get the claim approved and um done at the right number and the right scope how I get there, I mean, we use Xactimate all day. I'm not going to kid you. We have seven accounts. So we use it a, a lot, but at the same time, can you explain the lump sum? How, tell me your theory on the lump sum thing and why you feel it's sometimes necessary and or better. And then why does it keep getting rejected from the carriers? Because that, that's a frustration too. So, Yeah, I'll tell you, I'm a simple guy. So I hear about <laughs> lump sum and retail and all these different things. Here's what I like. I like bids. Right. I want to know what it's really going to cost to put on a roof. Uh, and I want to know what someone would bid for that job if they were trying to get it outside the insurance world. OK. And through a competitive bid process, right, we, we come up with a price, what it's really going to cost in that market. So Xactimate you know, is the, a good first step. Right. It's, it was intended to create what are called estimates. Right. What's an estimate? It's kind of a guess as to what it's going to cost. And if we can reach an agreement based upon estimates uh, from Xactimate, that's great. Let's get done and move forward. However, when we have a dispute as to what the final number should be, what it's going to actually cost, 
Because remember, for our CV coverage under our policies, we owe the amount actually incurred. Uh, right. you know, we're in that situation. Let's go get real bids. So whether it's lump sum or retail, I don't understand the difference. Okay. Right? What I want is a bid from a real contractor who will tell me that regardless of insurance, all right, here's what I would charge in the competitive market to put on this roof. And I think that if we can get to that model, I think we're well served because I hate insurance proceeds contracts. I don't understand why any contractor would ever do an insurance proceeds contract because you're agreeing to work for what the stingy insurance company says you get, <laughs> right? Why would you do that? So, you know, be a professional like any other business, put down your price. All right. Now your comment is a good one. Well, what happens when they, when the adjuster says, Oh my God, I don't know what to do with this. Right. I need Xactimate. Give them an Xactimate estimate then and say, here's what it's based on. All right. But this is my price. Uh, okay. And then we've got something to talk about, you know, because what I might do then, and I do this a lot and some guys on the other side, pull their hair out, but I'll go get a couple of contractors in the local community who I know who will put on the roof compliant with code and compliant with all requirements of manufacturers. And this is what they'll charge. And then I present that to the public adjuster and say, look, I got two guys who will do the work and do it right for this price. And what I find is that brings us together. Right. Uh, it allows us to say, okay, well, this is a little low and my guy charged a little more, but then we're able to get to a price and we stop playing what I call the Xactimate game. <laughs> right. You know, whether we include toilets and you know, drip edge and, and fencing and all this stuff or whether OSHA is included or not, I'm tired of all that. Right. Let's figure out what it's really going to cost. And I have found that whether we call it lump sum or retail pricing or just a bid, we can make a lot of progress. So that does the only problem with that. It doesn't work when there's a, a scope dispute. Right. Sure. I, yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's when I think guy, I think everyone's getting that confused. If you if we agree on scope, it's easy, right? We work the numbers up. But the problem is that doesn't work, nor does a lump sum thing work when there's, you know, um a carrier pays for 29 shingles or they're trying to patch a, a TPO when it's got to be all replaced because it's two layers and saturated. So that's when that lump that all goes out the window. And then we got to right. approve the scope. And that's that seems to be most of the discrepancies because the number can easily get worked out, I feel. That's that's not the most difficult part. The, the hard part is getting these scopes worked out when we have total dis disalignment of, of what the scope is. How, how do you propose that gets solved easily without litigation? I mean. Well, there's there's three things we can do when we have a scope uh, dispute. First, we bring in consultants, right? Both sides bring in engineers yep. or, or others who can help us better define the scope. Obviously, my uh, side of the uh, uses engineers and building consultants all the time. And, uh, you know, we see them on uh, on the other side often as well. So hopefully the professionals uh, can get involved, work together and reach agreement on, uh, on scope. So that's that's obviously the best thing to do when we fail that, um, you know, appraisal is an option. Uh, so, you know, the scope of appraisal has expanded greatly in the past decade. You know, appraisal yeah. used to be limited to just amount of loss when we were just fighting about what it costs to repair an agreed amount of damage. But the courts have expanded appraisal to involve disputes as to the extent of damage, maybe even the existence of damage. So uh, contrary to what some people are saying this past week that you're aware of, I'm not opposed to appraising scope of damage. All right, I'm okay with it, so long as it's clear. Right? I want clarity going into the appraisal process as to what's being appraised. Because the worst thing for our customers, the insureds, are we appraise without clarity as to what we're appraising. And then whoever's not happy about the award can then litigate it for three years, which yeah. is why I'm a big proponent of appraisal protocols, appraisal memorandums. You know, So anyway, that's the second thing we can do is try to resolve the scope issue with a, a well put together appraisal process. And then the third, as you alluded to, and the least attractive is litigation, uh, because then, you know, we're stuck for three years fighting and we'll have experts there. So the same thing happens in a lawsuit that happens at the very beginning. We hire consultants and then we argue and reach agreement at mediation. Why can't we do that in the claim process and save the poor insured several years of delay? Oh, I agree. You know, the biggest I want to talk, I'm glad you brought appraisal up because 
um, man, is there a, I get so frustrated because, you know, as you love the playing field and SVG and all these platforms, uh, everybody, appraisal is so, here's, here's my thing on appraisal. It's the most underused and yet overused thing in our, in our world. Nobody knows what the hell they're doing. And it's so frustrating. We do a ton of appraisals in here, but it's about quantity and cost period. It's not about coverage or it's, it gets, well, some States allow it now. I mean, Colorado does, and that's, that's, that's confusing the hell out of people. So can you talk about the, per, what, what, what exactly a, an appraisal should look like and then what it shouldn't look like? Cause there's a huge difference there. And a lot of, a lot of PAs don't know, and a lot of adjusters don't even know. We, we turn appraisal demands at all the time. They reject it. I'm like, you know, you're wrong. And we have to explain why they're wrong. And eventually it comes our way, but can you explain what it's supposed to look like for the policy and what it's not supposed to look like for the policy? Yeah, Chip has gotten really hot on this issue uh, in the past week. His blogs are focusing on the history of appraisal. And uh, he got really interested in this when we're talking in London and has been looking uh, into it. Uh, appraisal is there for one purpose, and that's to avoid lawsuits. Right. Right. It was, it's a non judicial dispute resolution process in the policy to resolve disputes so we don't have to go to lawsuits. So what appraisal is supposed to look like is a process to avoid litigation. What appraisal is not supposed to be is something that you invoke a year after you sue us uh, or you know things of that nature, which is just wrong. Uh, it's not supposed to be a dispute where you try to get the biggest possible number uh, and then we end up going and litigating for three years anyway. You know, so right. we've got to think about appraisal as a way to ensure that we can resolve a dispute amicably and avoid litigation. That's the intent. And there's some things we can do to make sure that happens. And the number one thing is to have clarity going into the appraisal process as to what the panel is addressing. We are always are, we're putting forward appraisal protocols all the time. Uh, and people on the other side saying, oh no, Badger's trying to screw me over with this form. Uh, and I'm not, I'm trying to get clarity. So at the end of the day, when that award comes out uh, from a panel of professionals, we can get to that issue in a minute. Yeah, yeah. When we have a panel of professionals. They tell us what the claim should be. We pay it, we're done. And everybody's reasonably happy you know, with the outcome. So that's what appraisal should be. It should be a way to avoid litigation altogether. And unfortunately, given gamesmanship and abuse and various issues and, and uncertainty in the law on some issues, that's a contributing factor as well. Right. We're seeing a lot of litigation post appraisal and that's unfortunate. Well, I think it's being abused on, yeah, it's just, it's being abused. It's, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it's just wrong how people are doing. It gets very frustrating. My biggest thing on, on, on appraisal as well is you could name Ann Betty as an appraiser. There's no, um, there should be some, I feel some sort of licensing or some sort of at least minimal qualifications besides, you know, being independent or whatever. There's got to be something that the both sides can invoke that somebody has some sort of background to be able to make these decisions properly. Because I mean, some of the stuff I get back, I'm, they have no idea what they're even, they've never even read a policy in their lives or, you know, brought on a tape measure. So it gets very frustrating, you know. And I get that. And the, you know, what's the problem is the appraisal clause has always been very short. Right, yeah. it's a one it's, paragraph it's, clause, exactly. like it. Uh, um, and it just has those two words: typically disinterested and uh, uh, competent, competent, disinterested, competent, unbiased. That's always just been the standard, and anybody can be competent. The courts have interpreted that really broadly. What's biased or, or interested is uh, is an interesting issue, and we could talk about that for a long time. But uh, you're right. You know, we need to figure out a way to get more qualified people in there. But we don't want to over legislate appraisal. We don't not there. And I've always been loath to legislate appraisal. Now, recently, there's some percolating discussion about whether maybe some basic parameters uh, to rein in the appraisal process uh, should be legislated. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that yet, but I understand why some believe it's necessary. And then the other thing is, as you've seen, some companies have uh, uh, broadened their appraisal language to better define. Uh, what a competent uh, and disinterested appraiser is. Uh, so yeah, you know, we need both sides to hire people who know what they're doing. I get that. And I hope, uh, I hope we all make an effort to do that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just every you, you, all these forums like I'll go to appraisal, throw it in appraisal. Well, it's a, a denied claim can't go to appraisal. There's nothing to appraise. It's it's a it, it's a that's a, a coverage issue which should be handled by a public adjuster and or an attorney. So, did did you have you ever gotten a file on your desk and you just shake your head because you know it's wrong? You know it's it's incorrect. Um, from my side, yeah. you're asking. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah, I've I've seen files and I've said, oh, geez, uh, I don't think the carrier got this one right. You know, I'm looking at photos or I'm looking at their coverage analysis or something of that nature. Sure. Uh, and we tell our clients on a regular basis uh, that, uh, you know, look, you have some exposure here, but I'll tell you what I haven't seen. OK, Let me go. so I admit I've seen mistakes from my clients and uh, both in their factual analysis and their legal analysis of coverage. But what I have never seen uh, from any of my clients, and it's primarily the commercial market, I have never seen a file where one of my clients has intentionally, intentionally underpaid uh, or tried to say it bluntly, screw over a policyholder. I've never seen it. I've looked at thousands of claim files, but I've never seen one where they've said, all right, we owe this, but we're going to intentionally delay it, or we're gonna to try to settle it for cheap, or all these things we hear about. Uh, I just don't see it, uh, and I'm in the commercial market. Maybe it's different in some of the residential yeah. market, but I, that I've never seen. Mistakes, you know, honest disputes every day. I wouldn't have a job uh, <laughs> if uh, there weren't any of those. But I need to be careful because I think it's important to say I do not see deliberate fraudulent conduct from my side with my clients. Well, I would beg to differ on some of the stuff we see, but that's that's my opinion, right? So. Um, so another big, one thing I do get tired of as well as all on these platforms is the word bad faith, the two words of bad faith. When, when I teach our PA classes, I instruct all our PAs, all our roofers, we never, ever talk about bad faith ever, 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 ever. I'm not an attorney. I don't want to get caught for practicing law without a license. Um, when I, when I see something or feel something, I'll turn over to Chip or to John Wood or one of the attorneys we work with and let them fight it out. So. And, and, you know, I, I asked Stephen Bush the same question. I asked all my attorneys, there's not a lot of bad faith. They don't go to trial a lot about bad faith. And I think that's a, another overused thing that it's too loosely used. Bad faith is a big deal to prove, right? It's not something you just, on a Tuesday, oh, we have bad faith. It, it's, it's, a, it, it's an egregious. Can you talk about exactly what bad faith is and what that looks like as well? And how many times have you gone to court with that as well in a, in a year, basically? So when an insurance company is alleged to have underpaid a claim, there's basically two causes of action, or let's say three causes of action that we typically see pursued. The first are the statutory penalties. Almost every state has what's called statutory prompt payment deadlines or statutory yeah. bad faith. These are laws that have been created to penalize insurance companies for improper conduct. In Texas, we have the Prompt Payment Act, 542. And uh, so we have to pay penalties and interest if we just underpay a claim. I understand that, okay, I get that. That's a, a penalty uh, for us underpaying a claim. So that's one. The second uh, is the duty of good faith and fair dealing, stated conversely, bad faith. Uh, and that is a common law duty recognized by a lot of states that uh, we owe to our insureds. We have a duty of good faith uh, and fair dealing to our insureds. What does that mean? Well, in Texas, it basically means that it's something more than a reasonable dispute. You know, there cannot be a reasonable dispute. If there's a reasonable dispute, there is not bad faith. Right. The insurer must have really taken an outrageous position. Uh, and that's why, you know, that you don't see that seceding very often because in most cases, uh, there is a reasonable dispute. The third cause of action we see all the time is a fraud-based cause of action. So in every single lawsuit where people sue my clients, with a few exceptions, we get sued for statutory uh, violations, common law, bad faith, and fraud. They throw that at us all the time, regardless of the fact that, you know, maybe this isn't a bad faith case. Maybe there is just a legitimate dispute as to whether dense to metal roofing constitutes damage. Okay. I mean, something like that, that we right. deal with all the time. So yeah, we get hit with those uh, all the time, but uh, typically what happens is um, 
The only thing that ultimately goes to trial uh, and uh, gets tried or has a real success, a likelihood of success uh, when we've done something wrong are the statutory penalties. Uh, we seldom see a verdict for the breach of the duty of good faith and fair dealing uh, or fraud, but it's thrown in all the time. So out of a hundred cases you guys get, how many of those are go to court over bad faith or go to trial, like go to jury? Yeah, go to a jury, maybe two. Uh, one, I mean, they most get resolved. Um, these are, you know, my cases are primarily larger commercial disputes. Right. We represent some of the regional uh, Texas residential carriers, um, but uh, the large commercial disputes, they get resolved. Yeah. That's and what I so in the past couple of years, I think we've tried in our office, maybe three cases. We've started a couple of arbitrations. Uh, they've gotten resolved. But uh, typically at the end of the day, you know, smart people sit down, they evaluate the risk. Uh, on both sides, and we're able to resolve them. And really, if we're doing our job right, uh, we resolve them early on. You know, we resolve them as soon as a lawyer shows up on the other side. All right, let's get let's talk about it. See if we can resolve it without a lawsuit. That was the whole purpose of our hail bill, right? When we enacted 542A in 2017, was send us a letter 60 days before the lawsuit is filed, so we know what we did wrong and we have an opportunity to resolve matters. And it works great with you know some uh, policyholder attorneys. As soon as we get that letter, we have a discussion. In fact, there's a reputable policyholder attorney in Houston uh, who just reached out to me after they sent their letter and said, "Hey Badger, you know we got this one. Uh, why don't we have a pre-suit mediation and see if we can get it resolved?" I love that, right? Because typically the facts aren't going to change any uh, in most of these uh, disputed matters. You know we know what the issues are. And uh, we can evaluate uh, on both sides in advance of a lawsuit. So shame on us, you know, if we just bill, 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 litigate, 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 and then settle on the courthouse steps. That's not good for anybody. Right. There's very few aha moments. Like there's no magic bullet on, on mostly the, the stuff we see. It's either it is or it isn't. And if it is, we'll, we'll fight to get the right thing. And if it's not, it's not. I mean, facts are facts. That's how we look at it. We try to, I tell all our guys, Steve, all our trainees, all, all my staff, our only job is to get the claim right, period. Whether it's a dollar, a nickel, a million, whatever the number is, scope and number is, that's, we're supposed to get it right. Document thoroughly, be professional and submit a thorough submission that have, that it states the facts. Here's, here's the weather, here's what happened, here's the, you know, the scope of damages, the photos, and submit them and, and negotiate in good faith on, on the behalf of the insured. That's our job, not to create this you know, fabrication, throwing stuff against the wall to make it stick. That's, that's the worst thing you guys, you know, we can do as, as, a, as a group. And I think that happens way too often. I think that's why, um, honestly, a lot of PAs are looked at as used car salesmen and ambulance chasers and this and that is a lot of, a lot of our side. And I'm, I'm taking the, the little bit of blame for that on our side is we, we don't do a great job with that sometimes. It's like you said in the beginning, it's way too easy to get a freaking PA license. It really is. I mean, I've been, I've, I started doing this in the late eighties for God's sake. And it's, it's changed dramatically and it's getting harder and it should be getting harder. Um, but yet this, the, the tests are the same. It's a joke. I mean, I can go take a Florida test today and pass in eight seconds. And that's not, that's not healthy out of the industry. And another frustration I do and to go and look further than that. Why don't the adjusters on the other side have to have licenses and we do, shouldn't we all have the same license? And like in some, some states you have a P license, a PA license, or an adjuster license, shouldn't it be the same license? That's what I have a huge question about. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, let's be clear, adjusters have to have a license, right? So everyone on my side, every adjuster has to have a license, at least in my state, in Texas. Right, right now, an interesting question is, should the exam uh, for PAs and independent adjusters be the same? You're doing the same work. Right. Uh, so I don't see any reason why the PA exam uh, should be any different than the IA exam with the exception of your ethical guidelines, sure. which are different, but the issues with respect to coverage and statutory issues and all that, it should be absolutely the same for both sides. I agree with that. And it's not, which is not. mind boggling, you know? Yeah. So in Arizona, my home license, we have the same license as the IA, but we're the only state that does that. And it confuses the hell. We go to reapply in Idaho where they're like, where's your PA license? Like, I don't have ones. We literally have this form letter we send every time. So it gets a bit frustrating. So um, one, one thing we do talk about in class as well, and, and Chip's, Chip teaches some of our stuff in our class, is a lot of PAs and roofers and, and individuals want to put all these state statutes in these emails and start 
uh, calling out the laws and stuff. Our firm doesn't do that. Um, I don't want to ever get a call from you about, hey, Hanks, you're practicing law without a license. I know a lot of PAs do, and a lot of roofing companies put stuff in those emails that are, are gray. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you look at that? Is, it, is, is that practicing law without a license, do you feel, or is it still on the borderline of not? Yeah, so let's separate the contractors from the PAs first. Okay. You know, contractors obviously do not have any licenses. They have no right to advocate on behalf of homeowners. Uh, so uh, I write a lot of letters to contractors uh, saying, hey, you're bleeding over into the unauthorized practice of public adjusting, which is also the unauthorized practice of law. Uh, so I have no problem with the contractor uh, showing uh, the adjuster damage or explaining the estimate. Okay. Uh, but when that contractor starts doing what you just described, you know, citing statutes for bad faith uh, in a letter and citing the law uh, on various topics. Yeah, that contractor at that point is engaged in the unauthorized practice of public adjusting. And as you've seen, you know, for example, in Texas, the Texas Department of Insurance has issued a number of cease and desist uh, orders against contractors and fined them to tell them to stop doing that. So I think it's gotten better. There's been an awareness of the issue over the past, you know, five, seven years and a lot of effort uh, to uh, try to separate uh, you know, what is and is not. I still think there's more that to be done and could be done. And I know there's an effort to, uh, to do that, but uh, so that's how it is for contractors. PAs, PAs are unique. I mean, yeah. the entire PA licensing uh, act is intended to be a carve out from the practice of law requirements. You know, prior to the PA licensing act, uh, PAs were getting in trouble for practicing law. So the public adjuster lobby came into states and said, hey, give us a little carve out where we can do this. Uh, and I have no problem with that. I get that, it makes sense. Uh, and the only issue that arises is, you know, the Texas PA statute says, while PA can negotiate claims and, and represent policyholders, they cannot practice law. Uh, so then the question is, what is practicing law versus being a PA? I'll tell you, I've never gone after a PA for practicing law. I have no problem discussing policy coverage with a PA uh, or, you know, once in a while when they hit me with, uh, you know, statements about bad faith, you know, I wish they wouldn't because it really right. is kind of borderline, but I'm not going to go after a PA uh, for okay. that. But I may try to rein them in a little bit, but I ain't going to turn them in uh, or anything like that. So, you know, the, the PA line uh, is, look, I'm advocating for the policyholder. Here's what the policy uh, covers and doesn't cover. I don't have any problem with that because I don't know how a PA can represent a policyholder without looking at and understanding the coverage. I think you just have to. So I don't consider that the practice of law. But yeah, yeah we do see some overreaching with some of this stuff that's uh, put into uh, some of these uh, uh, estimates or the letters. Oh, one other issue real quick. I understand Louisiana just went nuts on a bunch of PAs for what constitutes uh, the practice yeah. of law. And I, I haven't had a chance to look closely at it, but uh, that is a, an interesting uh, issue there given how much is going on in Louisiana right now. Yeah, they just I just got a memo too from Napia that they're actually gonna get rid of that hourly thing and, and go full percentage, thank God, which is great because it's, it's a nightmare um, paperwork wise to be honest with you in bookkeeping. Um, you, you know, I, I don't have any problem with, you know, PAs charging a commission. Uh, we could have a long debate about uh, how that commission is paid and whether it's getting paid out of insurance proceeds uh, as opposed to separately. But uh, maybe we'll save that for the end if we have time. Yeah, that's it's, that's that's tough. And I, I yeah, I get it. It's like it's I mean, there's 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 policies out now, too, that are saying if you if you elect this policy, you are waiving your right to have representation by a public adjuster. Yeah, so, well, I know, was it Florida or one state just came out with a bulletin and said, no, 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 you can't do that. Yeah, I, I've seen them, you know, and I can assure you that I'm, that's not something I'm advocating for. You know, as I've said every time, you know, there is a role for the public adjuster in the claim process. You know, there are insureds who need help putting their claims together. So I have no problem with the professional public adjuster who wants to make sure that the insured gets their damage uh, fixed uh, and paid for quickly. Yeah, there's a role for them in the claim process. We have this recorded, so I'm going to broadcast that last little bit now. I'll, I mean, it's, it is important. I mean, a lot of people don't know what the hell they're doing, and it's over. I mean, you know, we do we do a lot of work in Louisiana and, and the hurricanes, Steve, and it's it's over. I mean, it's overwhelming for these people, right? They're 
they're coming home and their, their house is gone or their business is gone after 20 years, their, their head's spinning. So um, we want to make sure they're, they're represented properly and get equal treatment. That's all. That's what it's about, really. We don't want to, once again, we're not overcharging. We just want to get the damn thing right. If Mrs. Smith is owed 180 grand, let's give her 180 grand, you know, and get her life restarted. Yeah, and I agree with that completely. The problem is I see a lot of PAs who uh, then submit to me an estimate for 600 grand. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's an issue. And, and I only see the abuses. I get that, but uh, I see a lot of them. And uh, part of the problem is that because there is no barrier to entry to become a PA, you know, 10 years ago, we had 170 PAs in Texas. Now we have a thousand. <laughs> so everybody's out trolling for work. And uh, that causes people to take matters that perhaps ought not be pursued, or they inflate matters to try to win the storm uh, on every single claim. And uh, that creates a lot of problems. If we could, again, figure out a way to get to a reasonable number early on, uh, we're all better off. My client, the PA, and most importantly, the insured. Right. That's that's exactly what it's all about. I mean, I, I get very frustrated as well when the it's uh, the we are looked at as kind of the stepchild of, of some of this stuff. And there are a lot, once in the, the crappy part, like we did talk about, there's a 5% on both sides that are the problem. There's 5% PAs are horrible. 5% of the roofers are horrible. 5% of the attorneys are horrible on both sides. And 5% of the adjusters are horrible. We all get that. 90 some percent of us are actually trying to do the right damn thing. And I, I believe you are as well. Um, you know, that's the frustration part. It's, I, I really want to just, Ugh, you know, on Facebook sometimes, like guys, stop. You know. Oh, look, and I, um, I resolve almost all of my claims. My office, you know, we uh, through our clients, we pay tens of millions of dollars, probably hundreds of millions of dollars a year in resolving claims. So I don't have any problem with resolving a reasonably disputed claim. But I think the reason I get so much attention is because I am so vocal that if somebody is trying to rip off my client, I'm going to fight back and really hard. Uh, and that's what really bothers me. But let's focus instead on the 90 percent of you know, what's in my office where we're trying to get to a fair resolution and resolve it. Right. But 10 percent where someone just completely overreaches and engages like the recent matters everyone's aware that I filed where I believe that there was fraudulent conduct and I sued insureds, appraisers and umpires for fraud for that conduct. Uh, we are going to fight back in that situation, but most matters, honest disputes and we get them resolved. I get that. I do, I do have an interesting question. Do you feel um, when you put yourself out there and so you're one of the few guys on the other side that people know, I mean, I've, I've met you six, seven years ago and I've never really met any other attorneys at these events on, on your side. For, I mean, quote unquote, um, they're all on, I mean, the hotelings in the woods and the uh, Stephen Bushes and the chips, those guys are all over the place. I and mean, we see them all the time. Do you ever feel like there's, um, and you just have like, damn, I wish I wouldn't hit send, or I wish I wouldn't have read that. Or, I mean, is it a little bit too much sometimes? Does it, do you think it ever like gets you in your head a little bit? Or does that make us what I'm asking? Does that make sense what I'm asking you? Yeah, it's a great uh, question um, and timely uh, for a number yeah. of reasons. So I don't do social media. Okay. You know, and I, people send me screenshots of uh, all these different forums where people are talking about me or raising issues and you know playing lawyer and saying things that are just wrong. And if I got into that uh, world, I'd never leave. I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't work. I'd right. just be sitting there texting and, and responding to things all the time. So I don't do that. Uh, and uh, I try not. I had a little exception recently uh, that you're aware of. You're welcome. Yeah, but um, but I so I typically don't do not do that because it's um, there's no value. And I also have a loud microphone that people give me through other forums and other ways to get my views out there. So you know the things that I do through the roofing organizations and uh, through public adjuster groups, podcasts. So yeah, I am out there. I have a chance to tell my story. I very much appreciate the opportunity to do that. Yeah. And uh, so I have two rules. You know, I, I typically do not respond to social media. Uh, I don't get involved in that. And number two, uh, I do not send emails after 9 p.m. after I've had two glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah. I, 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 
last night I opened a bottle of Pinot because it was a long day. So I, I turned it down at 8.30, I'm done. So it never goes well. No, um, it doesn't. My firm's ethics lawyer about eight years ago told me that uh, they were creating a badger rule that I cannot email after the <laughs> class line, either in a case or otherwise. And uh, it's been a very good rule for me to follow sure. uh, ever since then. And uh, for obvious reasons for everybody, and we should all follow that. And look, we're all out there trying to do two things. You know, we're trying to represent our clients uh, and we're trying to earn a living. Uh, no matter what side you're on, that's yeah. what you do. And if we all recognize that about one another and just focus on those issues and not attacking each other personally uh, or calling them the enemy and things like that, uh, we can actually all survive really well uh, and make a decent living and you know, help our clients and uh, help the policyholders, if that's not our client or whoever's on the other side, get to a fair result. Do you, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know Chip good, fairly well and hoteling fairly well. Do you think that at the end of the day that helps getting these cases resolved? Because you do, I don't say you have a personal relationship with them, but you know the person. You think that's got to help, I would think, on both sides. I mean, I would think if John Wood calls you on a case and you guys can, you have a rapport, it's going to be much easier to get to the finish line than it is if, if some, the, some disdain there. You know what I mean? I mean, same with us. Absolutely, it does. I mean, the fact that I have a relationship with a lot of PAs and with a lot of lawyers, it absolutely does help get matters resolved. Uh, I've got clients call me on matters. And first thing I say is who's on the other side. Okay. And when they tell me who it is, I'll say, okay, great. I can work with that person. We'll get it resolved. You know, John and I just had a matter this week, the last few days. And uh, it was a little contentious uh, on various issues between our clients. Uh, and uh, we, we, um, just worked it out. You know, we had got to a little dispute at the end. And uh, because of our relationship, we were able to say, okay, let's just do this and be done with it. Uh, same with Chip, which is why his blog with he and I having a beer at the Lamb in London uh, <laughs> got so much attention. Yeah. So you know, it's, uh, I, uh, I think most of these guys realize that, uh, you know, I'm a good guy to have a beer with. Uh, and I feel the same way about most people on the other side. Now, again, it's most. You know, right. there are some people that I just can't get along with um, and uh, either lawyers, adjusters, contractors, you know, and I think uh, it's obvious what the reasons are. We just have a difference of opinion that is uh, insurmountable uh, right. as to what's supposed to happen in the claims process. But again, that's the 5%. Yeah. The 95%, you know, Chip, I love having a beer with Chip. John, you know, John and I have hung out socially. Uh, with our girlfriends and, uh, you know, hung out and done things together. Uh, we enjoy uh, being together. We uh, try not to talk about cases, um, but uh, yeah, we have a great time together. Just because we're on the other side of each other professionally doesn't mean we can't be friendly personally. So, yeah, we do. I, I call these parking lot deals. I mean, I, I, I know I've been doing this for 30 some years. So I know a lot of the IAs and, and large loss adjusters. And our first conversation is, man, you let me know what you need from me to get this claim where it needs to be. And our job is to provide that information to him or them or her, just to give them the information they need to get the thing done. I mean, I, I don't want to have to see you on the other side of this. I mean, I mean, we, we, we've, we've done 650 claims in one year. I think I have eight of them with attorneys. So we're-, we're I, I got to pause you right there, okay? That is such an important thing to say, right? 650 claims and eight went to lawyers. Yep. All right. You talk about other old school PAs, right, who have been around a long time. Jim Beneke, Art Jansen. All right. These guys, their claims seldom end up with lawyers. Right? But then I heard a PA talk at Wind the Storm uh, last year, and he said, I had 50 claims end up with lawyers last year. Right? Well, something ain't right then. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, if a, a PA, uh, most matters can get resolved. So lawyers end up resolving them. So if you're acting as a lawyer, as a PA, because you have this little carve out to do that, why can't you resolve your claims also? And, and I know I'm going to hear a lot of reasons why they, they can't. But <laughs> I do believe that, you know, and that's just something we tried to address in Texas in our legislative change in 2015, right. where PAs can only sign up claims and they actually work them and try to resolve them. They can't just sign them up flip them to lawyers, oh. and it's an annuity. Just wait for the money to come in and get a check down the road. That yeah. really bothers me. So when I see PAs who are not actively working claims and trying to resolve them, uh, I think that's a problem. 
Well, it's it, number one, it's called running and it's illegal. So, right. It's that dude. Uh, so I want to say that drives me insane. Um, I posted the other day on, on social media. I had a claim in, 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 in Ida and uh, it was a, a, a single mom, $138,000 claim. Not a, I mean, I, we, I, 114 emails and phone calls. We got it done finally. And we lost my, I guarantee I lost money doing the damn thing, but that I could have flipped that five months ago to an attorney, but I knew in my heart, it was the right, we were doing it right. And the claim was right. And we were, we were not wrong. So I finally got to hold the uh, supervisor off the, off the record. I'm like, Hey man, I go, I guarantee you I'm right. I 1000% swear my father's grave that we are right. Can you please look at this again? And six days later, I got an email. He goes, Hey man, I appreciate it. You're right. Check's coming, you know? So we do a lot of stuff like that just by, I, I call them parking lot deals where you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're making, you're, you're, you're appealing to the human side of these guys and, and gals. Cause they do like I said, most of them want to do a good job. They just get overwhelmed. I mean, they're getting their asses. How many of these, these hurricane adjusters are having hundreds of, I don't know how they do it. It's impossible. And that, cause they're understaffed and they're, probably underpaid, I'm guessing. I don't know what they make, but I, I wouldn't want to do that job on the other side. I mean, that would, in a cubicle all day doing 150 claims, there's no way, man. There's no way. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I know how they're not paid. They're not paid by reducing claim amounts, okay? So <laughs> that's not the uh, it's not the payment model for adjusters in my world. Uh, and we hear that, but uh, I've seen how they're paid. And adjusters do not have any motivation to underpay a claim. In fact, a lot of adjusters and the cats, you know, they're paid on a per claim basis. And uh, so, you know, if they're, uh, if they're being really chintzy uh, and it just makes the claim harder for them, they have every motivation to pay the higher amount, make the insured happy and be done. Uh, and I truly, that's, that's what I see, but uh, uh, no, you're uh, you know, again, back to the training and issues. I understand it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they should have a reasonable workload. Uh, I get it. But sometimes it's hard. We're after big disasters. You know, oh, the man. industry, the industry is spread thin at times. And all I can say is that uh, I would hope people would be understanding of that uh, as, uh, you know, it just happens in any industry. Sometimes people are really busy uh, and uh, and work with us to get it done. So there's been a, a plethora of insurance carriers go bankrupt in Louisiana recently. That's and Florida, you know, yeah. Florida is a big issue. I think any time now we're supposed to hear what the reform uh, proposals are. You know, I did a uh, article for the Claims Journal uh, with a lot of quotes recently. They were uh, asking about our Texas experience and what could be done in Florida. And I said very clearly, the first thing, the most important thing that can be done is to end AOBs. You know, we don't have AOBs in Texas. They're not allowed and uh, they should not be allowed in Florida. You know, the, the vast majority of disputed and I will say fraudulent claims begin uh, with a contractor driven claim. Uh, and that's just what we, that's the reality of what we see. I'm not painting with a broad brush right. of saying all contractors are bad, but a lot of the, the majority of the, of the problematic claims uh, begin with contractors. And as soon as that contractor takes an OOB, uh, well, he's got an interest, obviously, that's sure. different from the insureds. The contractor's interest is maximizing his profit Whereas the insured's interest is just getting his damage fixed. And, uh, and that's the problem with the AOB. The interests are not aligned. Uh, so there are plenty of people who will help a, a uh, insured pursue a claim uh, without having to assign it to a contractor. Right. So any argument that they need the contractor to help the insured is bullshit, right? Because there's plenty of PAs and there's plenty of uh, lawyers who will help those policyholders with their claims. Now, there is a role for the contractor, and that is to help get the damage fixed, to explain the estimate, to explain the damage, but not to take over it uh, so they can then try to maximize the money from the claim process. That's not their position. My, my frustration with that um, a little bit, a lot of the roofers have these AOB, and they're, they're only looking at the roof. And there's structural, like a tornado hits, they're only worried about the 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 the, the shingles and there's the trusses are tweaked or snapped or the, the house is racked and uh, the windows aren't closing anymore. And so they're, they're, they're missing. A, m once again, 90% of the guys, 95% of the guys I work with are, are not like that. They're, they're contractors, you know, they're, they're looking for, they're, they're once again, getting the claim, right. But there's a lot of these guys are just, they're door knocking and they're like, Mrs. Smith, I just want to do your roof and get the hell out of town. And that, that hurts the industry again as a whole, because, once again, getting the claim right is the idea, not just the three tap. 
not just the three tab or the tile that's discontinued and da da da. It's about the whole process of the claim, getting the claim right. And they're number one, they're not scoping it properly. And two, they're, they're actually hurting the client because there are damages there nobody's going to look for. And five years later, they're going to sell the house. And there's a problem. And that's, that's, that's very, these, some of the door knocking stuff, um, if it's done, if it's done well, that's great. But it's, you were on stage a couple of years ago with John. I remember hearing this about kill, killing the golden goose, right? Um, it, not everybody has a roof claim, right? Not every roof in the country has damage. A, a lot of companies are throwing crap against the wall to see what sticks. And that's a horrible business model. And it makes my life miserable. And I'm sure it makes your life miserable as well. Well, it does. And this is, you know, I, I say this all the time. Insurance companies do not sit around thinking about how to change their policy forms or how to change statutes. They do not, but they do uh, make those changes in reaction to issues, to abuses. Okay. So everything you've seen come out of the insurance industry in the past few years with respect to a legislative change or a policy form change is a result of abuses. Uh, and uh, it's just the, the reaction of what happens. And we could talk about each of them uh, and what's causing these things to occur. You know, the one I keep talking about and Chip's uh, blogged about it recently as well, is uh, the emergence and we're seeing more and more managed repair and preferred contractor yeah. programs. I mean, talk about killing the golden goose, right? That's bad for contractors who are not part of those programs because they're gonna lose work. And I recognize the PAs aren't happy about it because there's no way to make money uh, if the uh, claim just goes into a managed repair or preferred contractor situation where the insurance company pays direct uh, to the contractor uh, because then the PAs are actually gonna have to tell their homeowners, or their clients, hey, uh, I'll help you, but you've got to pay me out of pocket because there's no cash coming in to the insurance claim. Right. So you know, these are the examples. It's, and the, another one hot right now is, you know, notice the loss uh, provisions. You used to always say prompt notice. That was it. But now most carriers are going to an absolute one year notice a claim deadline. And why is that? Well, because we saw lots of contractors trolling neighborhoods two years after the storm, drumming up questionable claims that even though we could get them dismissed, uh, it costs a lot of money to deal with. Uh, so now we're just going to a straight one year notice of claim deadline with no exceptions. And uh, that's that's a reaction to what's right. happening out there. The managed repair program, I, I, I don't like it, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't imagine you will either. I mean, it, it seems to be very monopolizing the, the claim process. Um, and what if they're, once again, what if they're wrong? I mean. Only, only, only solution is litigation. Am I right? I mean, well, look, I, uh, I support certain programs uh, when a policyholder has a choice. Okay, so this is Steve Badger's view. I'm not speaking for anyone else. All right, uh, or any of my clients. Uh, you know, I recognize the strong desire that people have to pick pick their own contractor uh, to uh, repair damage. I recognize people have that, right. but if the homeowner chooses a policy that uh, allows the carrier to select the contractor and that uh, homeowner has a reduced premium or some other benefit for doing that. I recognize that that's legitimate. Um, I also see some programs coming where a uh, homeowner can go into a preferred contractor uh, manager pair type program by choice. And by doing that, they have certain uh, uh, increased incentives or benefits right. uh, by going into that. Like what yeah, we're going to do. Right. Yeah. yeah, and then they have the right to do it. Now, if you know, if the if the insurance company uh, wants to uh, have that type of program and pre and refer contractors, sure. Are they going to end up with a few lawsuits if the contractor does a crappy job? I get that. Uh, that might happen, but uh, I think what we're going to see is the vast majority of them get done without any concern at all. You know, I get a call every week from someone ripped off by a contractor, and I do because if you you know you Google roofing contractor fraud Texas, my name pops up. So every week I'm helping homeowners pro bono uh, address issues with bad contractors. But I've never gotten a call from someone says, hey, my manager repair contractor ripped me off. Okay, that hasn't happened. Uh, so, you know, I understand the dislike for it in, uh, in various industries, but it's coming. And uh, I do believe that there are some efforts to, uh, to create reasonable programs that are good for the insureds. Right. So one thing I do want to talk about that I engineer reports that we get on a daily basis. Out of 100, I bet 99 of them are um, not finding the same damage as we are. And it's, it's, it's frustrating and it's, it's man, it, it's, um, and they're blatantly wrong. 
can you, why is number one, I, why are these same companies being used over and over again? And why, why are they so blatant? I don't want to say blatantly, but why are they, they're, they're never in the gray. They're never towards the insured. They're always, man, they're, they're heavily weighted. Right. So let's just be clear, Jack, you're talking about the engineering reports the policyholders are getting, right? That you're hiring your engineers? No, 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 no. I'm... <laughs> that's, that's my point, right? I, right. So I, I could say the same thing. Okay. Uh, I know who I get injury reports from policy old attorneys and PAs who are using the same guys. You can list six people on my side who you see a lot, and I can list six on your side yeah. that you see a lot. All right. So everything that you just said, I could repeat verbatim from the people that your side is using. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so no, no, my, my frustration with that, it shouldn't be anybody's side. These guys have their own licenses. They right. should just be whatever the hell it is, it is. And, and, I, and I agree. That's right. And, uh, and I 100% agree. And why do we have this difference? I don't know. You know, is there an honest, uh, is there an honest gray area for difference of opinion? Sure, there is. Right. Whether this granule loss to a modified is hail or aging, Okay, we can debate that. Whether this dent uh, constitutes physical loss or damage is going to cause the metal to deteriorate over time, we can debate that. Right. Things like that I get, and those are the gray areas, and engineers have their opinions. And perhaps if you work for policyholders a lot, your opinion is one way. If you work for carriers a lot, it's another. But those are opinions, right? And they're entitled to those as long as it's reasonable. But if you're an engineer out there still using the bubble test to say that there's wind damage when there's no standard anymore, ASTM and FM have both withdrawn that standard, and you're still doing that test, well, that's not very good uh, or, or whatever, right? Those right. are the, the fringes that are wrong. But I don't have a problem with there being differences of opinion by engineers uh, because they view damage differently. I, I get that. So... I kind of reject your statement that 99% of the reports on my side are bullshit, no damage finding. <laughs> and if we're going to say that, then I have to say that, well, 99% of the reports from engineers on your side are bullshit damage findings. So I don't think either are accurate. Uh, right. I do think that there's a big gray area. But again, 5% on both sides yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, are skewing the opinions uh, overall. It's very, it's very frustrating because it's, yeah, I, we've gotten a back. For, well, I'm sure you same for our side. I mean, the photos are wrong, the address is wrong, and it's we'll spend an hour breaking it down. And it's just, it's just, man, let's just get it right. You know, it's very, very frustrating. That's my, that's my biggest pet peeve is these, these crappy engineer reports. And then, because you know, I, I, my license means a lot. I'm sure your law degree and your bar it means a ton to you. And these guys don't seem to have the same, um, I don't want to say ethical, but they don't have the same desire to to get these damn things accurate. And that's it's very frustrating is all. I mean, we get reports back that the, the weather was pulled 18 miles from the property. Well, we all know it, that, that can vary. So, you know, we try to do a good job of getting an accurate weather report and making, because, you know, it, it could be hailing here and two miles away, it couldn't be, or vice versa, right? So- and we, look, and I agree with all that. And I'll tell you, people have seen lately that I have seen experts, weather experts, uh, roofing experts, moisture detection experts. I've seen people on the other side who I thought were reputable and I'm using them. Okay. I am hiring people who I used to be adverse to on some matters uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because I think they, they do a good job. I've seen them try to be honest. And two, it helps me uh, in litigation when that person is typically a policyholder expert. Sure. Uh, it's kind of hard uh, for the plaintiff to go after them when I'm using someone who's typically working for plaintiffs. Uh, so I just want people who will tell me the truth. I really do. That's it. Uh, tell me the truth. Uh, and uh, whatever, you know, whether it hailed on that day, you know, I've been hired, uh, hiring Howard Altschul lately. Howard's great. Typically works for policyholder uh, side people, wants to do more work on my side, but he tells me the truth as to whether it right. hailed at that location on the data loss. And that's what I want. So I think a lot of, uh, I think both sides, we don't, we, we look at the, we don't want to know the truth and it. It's the first thing we do, man. We look at the policy is in effect. What was the weather that date? And is, is there legitimate damage from that date when the policy was in effect? Yes or no. If there was great. If there wasn't, I, we probably turned down 30 some percent of the claims we, we, we have in here because they're, just, they're not real. And that doesn't help anybody when these crappy claims are turned in. It, it, it makes your job 
10 times more than it should be and more difficult. And we're just moving paper for no reason whatsoever. And we're hurting the insurer at the same time. That's not fair. Jack, you know what happens with that 30% you turn down? 27% of those end up with someone else who will yeah. chase. It. Yeah. And that's the problem that we face. Uh, yeah. Because there is somebody out there who's willing to pursue everything, just hoping to squeeze a little something out of us. Well, you know, what's that blind squirrels find nuts every and I, I like, oh my God, I got this. Every once in a while, somebody gets lucky and something goes awry and they do get something paid that shouldn't have. That's, that doesn't mean it's, it's always the right thing to do. I had an interesting call yesterday. One of our trainees called me. I won't mention any names. Good, good dude. Works hard, brand new. And he goes, hey, I got a claim that they paid hail for on one panel. It's discontinued, but I don't find any hail damage. <laughs> what would you do? And I said, oh my God, that's the world's shittiest claim for a PA. Um, and so we, we, we took a deep breath and we said, you know what? We're, we're, we preach to do the right thing. So the right thing is not to go after the discontinued roof because there's no hail damage. You know, and that it took, a, I'm not going to kid you, Steve, that took a lot of, um, so, I mean, the, we knew it, we both knew the right answer, right? So it, it, but it took a lot not to say, hey man, go after it and, you know, let's get what's, let's, let's make it, get what's ours. And, but that's not fair. And if, if, uh, if we're preaching fairness, we got to be fair as that as well. And that's a one in a million shot, right? That very rarely happens on our side. But it, it, that was a discussion we had to have. And it, it was very interesting to me because we preach this stuff. And then when it comes to reality, man, it's a, it's a gut check. I'm not going to kid you because you really want to go after and get that. You want to get that client the million bucks. Um, well, and I see, I have two similar examples. One where I do, we'll reach out to a PA and say, hey, man, I, I don't think you knew about this info about a prior yeah. claim eight years earlier. Uh, oh, I didn't. I'm sorry, Badger. You know, you're right. My insurer didn't tell me that. I'm withdrawing from the claim. Yeah, so we and we see those. I mean, once we give full information uh, that perhaps the PA didn't get from the insured uh, uh, on whatever the issue is, uh, we see PAs withdraw uh, from claims, and that's uh, we appreciate that. You know, instead of saying, "Oh, well, can you pay me something anyway?" Uh, so that's uh, that's good. And the other situation we have, though, is kind of on the other end, where uh, uh, there uh, are claims that are coming in that we know they're completely bogus, but they're just trying to get something out of us. Uh, and some of them know that uh, my only option is to fight them all the way through summary judgment or trial, or just pay what we call an extortion payment of, you know, 15, 20 grand or something just to go away. Uh, and there's a lot of guys out there who are just making a living doing that, uh, PAs and lawyers, because they know the insurance companies have to make typically a business decision uh, on whether to pursue these. And, uh, and there are some guys who do that. So we got both ends. We got the yeah. reputable. And, and I know you can, you know, there's similar stories on my side. I get that. Uh, but uh, that's what we see. So one question I do have also, probably one of the last ones before you get wrapped up. I know you get get going. So um, I was named an appraiser in Utah on, on a claim. An American family came back and said, we, we, we can't uh, approve him because of his social media post. Dude, I'm, I, so I'm, 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 I'm convinced and I, I know that Insurance companies watch us, right? They're, they're watching PAs and attorneys and, and roofers, I'm guessing, right? Absolutely. I mean, sure. the first thing that I do in my office that when a name shows up that I don't recognize, uh, I get on social media uh, okay. and I look at what they're posting online. So, for example, if I'm evaluating whether an appraiser is biased, all right, there was a short period of time, I admit it, a number of years ago where we took the position that simply because you're a PA, uh, you're an advocate and you can't be an appraiser. All right, we took that position, but uh, over time, we decided, no, we're not going to do that. That's not fair to the PAs who want to act as an appraiser, can be impartial, work by the hour, not a, on a contingency basis. <laughs> so we stopped taking that position. But what we still do, whether it's a PA or a contractor or whoever, we look at other factors to see if it's just un impossible for that person to take off their advocate hat uh, and put on a neutral appraiser fact finder hat, which is what we want in appraisal, right? We want people who can be neutral fact finders to just help us get to a resolution. Now, is everyone you know, somewhat of an advocate for their side? I think sure. we've seen the distinction about I'm, a, I'm an advocate for my position, not for my side. So I get that there is advocacy involved, but yeah, we got a contractor um, uh, stricken as a PA and a finder as a appraiser uh, because of what was on his website. He basically said all insurance companies suck 
uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna help you get your roof bought. Uh, and a federal court saw that and said, yeah, that he's biased against insurance companies. Uh, so yeah, we pay attention to social media. I, you know, every day people are sending me stuff that's posted on the various forums. I keep it all uh, and we use it when we have to. No kidding. So I don't think many people realize that. That's why you gotta be careful what you hit send on, man. Oh, people... sure, sure, there's so much. Yeah, here, yes, you have to be careful what you hit send on. <laughs> Now look, we don't we don't move to strike many appraisers. I get that. There are a few. I mean, there are some people who I just believe uh, on on the other side who just cannot be unbiased. Uh, that just that's not in their in their blood. They can't do it. And, and vice I know versa. This, yeah, and there's, there's there's a couple that we get in here. I'm like, there's no way the dude's a thousand for a thousand on the other. He's they come in below the appraisal. They come in below the carrier on the appraisal. I'm like, it's almost impossible that many times in a row. So same. It's once again that five percent, right? It's we keep well, I'll tell you, there's a couple of people who appraise on my side that I won't use, right? I won't use. There are appraisers for the insurance industry that I will not use. Uh, and obviously, I'm not going to state any names, but, you know, <laughs> I just because I, for various reasons. So I, I'm just looking for people who will give a fair answer. I get that. So to wrap things up, how do you, um, when people call you Darth Vader, does that get out of your skin or? Is that a compliment or, I mean, how do you, hell do you feel like that? How do you, how do your kids, did they laugh about that? I mean. Yeah, everyone you know, laughs about it. I, I yeah. kind of, uh, I enjoy it. It's fun. Uh, you know, John Hotelling obviously started that. In fact, I think earlier I said that John and I and our girlfriends, you know, have traveled together, not his wife, not his girlfriend, his right. wife, Julia. Yeah, we probably uh, need to clarify that. Otherwise, I, be I thought I better <laughs> clarify that, right? It, it was Julia and my yeah, girlfriend. My old, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they got along very well, but it was, you know, Chip's girlfriend and my girlfriend in London last week uh, with us. And we all went out to dinner and had a great time. So, you know, John created this Darth Badger, Darth Hoteling or Darth uh, Vader thing. And, um, you know, look, it's, it's fun. You know, there's nothing negative and ugly about it at all. It truly is fun. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't bother me. You know, what bothers me though, is when I see people post things that Badger's an asshole or Badger's the enemy, Badger this or that. Uh, that's unfortunate because I don't believe those people have actually tried to listen to what I say. Um, I'm really clear. We will settle disputed claims, but if you try to rip off my client, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to fight back hard. Uh, and I think that's why I get a lot of uh, yeah. attention because I do that. You know, I will fight back hard on behalf of my clients, just like advocates on the policyholder side should fight for their clients when they believe insurance companies do something wrong. I have no problem with that. 1000%. And I do want to give you credit. When you were on stage, you literally put your cell number on that freaking screen. I don't yeah, think I would ever do that. That would drive me insane. But yeah, that's, uh, I give you credit for that, Steve. I get 50 or 60 emails a day and texts from just random people raising issues. And I really do try to sit down every night and, uh, and respond to them uh, if they're legitimate. Uh, and most of them are, you know, most are legitimately raising issues. And then, uh, uh, you know, I'll uh, try to develop relationships with those people. And what I find and through things like this is that it does help me and my clients resolve claims. Uh, right. I really, I think my clients benefit from the discussions that we have uh, that uh, I mean, there's so many PAs and contractors that I've met uh, uh, through all of these different events where their name shows up on the other side. And I say, hey, wait a minute. I just, you know, met this guy at a conference. Let me call him up. Uh, before uh, it gets ugly and we work things out. Uh, and uh, really that is what we try to do in the vast majority of matters. Relationships, man. Yeah, it is. Yeah, cool. So um, last question, if you had to give advice to this industry, if you, if you could just pick one thing and make it click for all of us, what, what the hell would that be? Play the long game, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to win the storm on every claim. All right, uh, climate change, the disaster business, you know, it's getting better, okay? It's not going away. And there's a lot of reputable players who have been around a really long time uh, on your side who have made a really good living uh, and they're still here. Whether they're a contractor, a PA or a lawyer, they're around a long time because they play the long game. They know that if they're reasonable, they can make reasonable money on each matter and continue to move forward and be here a long time. But what I see happening are guys who are trying to win the storm on every single claim. They wanna scale it, you know, grow their business. And I watch them come 
make a splash, and then flame out and go away. And I can give you a whole list of names of PAs and lawyers and contractors who in just my eight years where I've been the hail guy uh, here, uh, I've watched them come, flame out, a couple have gone to prison and, uh, and be gone. Uh, so play the long game, you know, develop relationships on the other side, be reasonable. And uh, I think you're going to do okay in the long run. This, uh, this business isn't going away. No, it's going to get busier. But we we can barely keep up. I mean, it's it's a lot. I'm sure you guys are the same way. It's it's insane. So, yeah. yeah. How do people get a hold of you if they want to uh, uh, questions or comments or concern? How do they get a hold? What's the best way, Steve? Two one four five five seven eight four two six. I mean, here's my cell phone number. Good lord. Two one four five five seven eight four two six or s badger at zell dot com z e l l e dot com. I have no problem giving it out. I'm happy to discuss issues, uh, respond to questions, and uh, don't leave me a voicemail. Send me a text or send me an email. That way I can respond to you uh, in writing. Uh, I'm always happy to talk with anyone about the issues, anyone who's reasonable uh, and wants to have a productive dialogue. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate the band. Once again, I, I really think, I mean, I don't know you that well. Probably thank God because we, we run a pretty clean show over here. So yep. uh, we appreciate, I mean, I, I do appreciate you coming on. I mean, there, it takes some cojones to do that because you were, there was a target. Um, you know, like I said, 95% of us want to do the right thing. I, I feel the insurance companies, most of them are, are, are pretty decent people. We all have our, you know, our, our war stories, so, so to speak. But if we didn't have war stories, I wouldn't have this beautiful office and, you know, <laughs> live in Scottsdale. So it is what it is, but we work hard. And I, I, I think you guys do too. And I, I appreciate your time and your energy and putting yourself out there because it, it, it does dialogue even bad dialogue was better than no dialogue, right? And disagreements are okay. And it's, it's gonna keep happening and happening because it, it's never a perfect world. We're dealing with people and emotions and law and un unclear laws and all that stuff. It's, and it's ever changing, so. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me on and uh, I appreciate the dialogue, just like you said. Uh, and hopefully our paths will not cross <laughs> any claims. Uh, and that'll uh, certainly indicate that uh, you are doing uh, in the field exactly what you're preaching here. Uh, and uh, keep doing it because our paths have not crossed on claims. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. And I, I see the same PAs, same uh, roofers over and over again. And there's a lot of PAs who uh, I never see. And, uh, and that's good. I appreciate that, man. So anyway, keep working hard, stay safe out there. I will see you at the next event, I'm sure. And we'll have a beer. So uh, anyway, right. take care. Thanks again. I really appreciate everything, Steve. Thanks so. everyone. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Because Experience Matters podcast. That's all for today's show. If you want to learn more or work with Jack in person, visit www.thejackhanks.com. Oh, and don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes or Spotify to continue to grow the podcast and change the industry.